Well, you can turn your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. This morning we are going to be considering verses 15 through 22 in the Olivet Discourse. So let's just begin with reading our text. It's Matthew chapter 24, and I'll begin reading in verse 15. Please hear the word of the living God. So when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in the name of your Son, who has given us direct access to you. Lord, we know without him we would be lost without hope, without understanding. But by your Spirit, you have given us life, and you have given us the Scriptures to direct us. And so as we come to this passage of Scripture, one that has been debated for many years, Father, we ask that you would give us a great deal of understanding this morning. Pray that you would help me to preach your word with clarity and that in some way, in a meaningful way, I might be able to bring understanding over this text. Father, I pray that you would guard my mouth, that you would keep me from saying anything that would be outside of your revealed will. God, I pray that you'd have your way in our midst and that you would even be so gracious to convict us of sin and to convince us more and more of your glorious truth. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, last week I began our study of this chapter by first introducing the various approaches to the Olivet Discourse. We first considered the futurist approach, which views verses 4 through 35 of this chapter as referring to events that will be fulfilled in our future. And then we considered the preterist approach, which views verses 4 through 35 as referring to events that have already been fulfilled in our past. And then, of course, we considered the everyone is wrong, and I'm right view being facetious, we consider the partial preterist approach, which sees verses 4 through 35 as referring to events that pertain to our past, to our present, and to our future, and that is the one, that is the view that I subscribe to. And so in verses 4 through 14, the verses that we looked at last week, we saw how Jesus was speaking of ongoing realities that will be recurrent throughout the church age. We also saw how the proclamation of the gospel to the world will be the decisive sign that the end of the age is at hand. And then, of course, we also learned that there also will be an increase in lawlessness. Now, after describing these distressing realities that will be characteristic of this entire evil age during which the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed to the world, 
In verses 15 through 22, Jesus then goes on to talk about one part of that age which will experience unparalleled distress. And this is when Jesus is going to focus on the first question of the disciples. Remember when they were there on the Mount of Olives and Jesus had uh, told his disciples that not one stone was going to be left upon another, referring to the temple that was standing in their own day, referring to Herod's temple, that had provoked the disciples to ask a couple of questions, one of which was, when are these things going to be? Jesus, you say the temple's going down, it's going to be crumbled to the ground. When's it going to happen? Well, in verse 15 through 22, Jesus speaks about realities. Things that are going to happen that will signal the temple's destruction. Which means that for the disciples in the first century, this was prophecy. But for us living in the 21st century today, this would be fulfilled prophecy. I agree with Craig Blomberg who says, given the thoroughly Jewish nature of all the details of verses 15 through 20, their close correspondence to the actual events of the mid-first century, and the more explicit wording of Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24, there is no reason to take any of Matthew's text here as looking beyond the events that culminated in the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. And I agree. So as we examine this passage this morning, there are four truths that Jesus spoke about that I want to draw your attention to. First of all, there is the abomination of desolation. Secondly, there is the warning to flee. Third, there is the great tribulation. And fourth, there is the promise of mercy. So we have the abomination of desolation, the warning to flee, the great tribulation, and the promise of mercy. So let's begin. Look at verse 15. Jesus said, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Now when Jesus says, So when you see the abomination of desolation, I think that this is marking a transition in this chapter. Now, at first sight, it may seem like this statement may just be naturally following what Jesus previously said about the gospel of the kingdom being proclaimed in all the world from verse 14. However, when you look at Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, you'll notice that they are much more explicit in demonstrating that the abomination of desolation is not an event that is necessarily connected to the time when the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in every nation under heaven. According to Mark and Luke's recollection of Jesus' final discourse, they made it very clear that when Jesus began to discuss the abomination of desolation, that he was transitioning to another topic. So in Mark chapter 13, verse 14, it says, But when you see the abomination of desolation, it's the same thing in Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 21, verse 20, it says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you see, the phrase, but when you see, is a way of transitioning to a new topic, and I think that's, that's what Jesus is doing here in this section. So after Jesus warns his disciples about many of these generic things that will be taking place throughout the course of this present evil age, he then narrows his focus by addressing the first and foremost question that was on the mind of the disciples. Namely, when will these things be? Uh, Jesus, how are we going to know when the temple is about to be obliterated? And what's the answer to their question? Well, Jesus says, whenever you see the abomination of desolation. Now, to understand what the abomination of desolation is, we first need to understand those two words, abomination and desolation. What do they mean? Well, the word abomination refers to something more than something that is just sinful. 
or evil. Okay, the word abomination, now it can refer to several things, but it refers to a sacrilegious act, something that is blasphemous, idolatrous, repulsive, something that desecrates the holy and profanes that which is set apart. And then you have the word desolation, which refers to something that is deprived of its purpose, something that has been laid waste. It is devastating something to the point of complete and utter destruction. And you'll also notice that Jesus, uh, when he talked about the abomination of desolation, he also spoke about the fact that this was something that was spoken about by the prophet Daniel. Now, that is only mentioned in Matthew's gospel, and the reason for that is because Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. And any first century Jew who would have heard the term abomination of desolation would have immediately had their minds turning because there was another event in, history, in Israel's history that all Jews knew about that was referred to as the abomination of desolation. So you have to understand that this wasn't a foreign concept to them. There was a historical reference point that they had in mind that they referred to as the abomination of desolation. And so I think that Jesus wants his audience to understand that what's coming in their future will be reflective of another previous event that took place in their past. Now, that phrase, abomination of desolation, is used three times in the book of Daniel. It's used in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, and Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. Now, I'm not going to go into the book of Daniel and get into all the specifics of those prophecies to see exactly what Daniel was referring to. Uh, all I want to do at this point is simply underscore one point that pretty much everyone is in agreement on, which is that Daniel, when he spoke about an abomination of desolation, in a couple of those passages in the book of Daniel, he was referring to the abomination of desolation that took place in 167 B.C. Okay, this is when Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who was the king of the Seleucid Empire, had defiled the temple by having a pig sacrificed on the altar and dedicated it to the Greek god Zeus, and he did this while he was in the Holy of Holies. This was an abominable act to the Jewish people. You need to know that Antiochus Epiphanes IV was a wicked, wicked man. He was a cruel tyrant. He was known for his insane brutality. He wanted to completely wipe out and exterminate the Jewish people. He made the owning of Scripture illegal, such that... Anyone who was found with scripture would be immediately executed. He forbade the Jewish people from circumcising their children, and he kept them from observing their strict Sabbath laws. He completely ransacked Judea, killing thousands of people, and compelled the Jewish people to flee to the mountains for refuge. But in 167 B.C., there was a man by the name of Mattathias, who was the Jewish high priest, and he had enough of this, and he ended up leading a revolt that eventually led to a great victory over Antiochus and his troops, and they had to cut and run. And this victory ultimately came through his son, Judas Maccabeus. And so there was a period of about three and a half years from 167 B.C. to 164 B.C. Where, uh, where the Israelites were at war with the Seleucids uh, during that time. And at the end of it, Judas Maccabeus had rededicated the temple and the altar. And you can read about this in the book of First and Second Maccabees. And till this day, the Jews still celebrate uh, this day. They commemorate the victory that the Jews had during that time. It's called Hanukkah. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus wasn't referring to the event that took place nearly 200 years earlier. 
Uh, but he is speaking about another abomination of desolation that will be similar to the one that took place before them. Now, several explanations have been given to explain what exactly the abomination of desolation was. Some think that it was referring to the zealots who desecrated the temple in 66 AD by bringing carcasses into the temple. But I think that Luke's gospel makes it pretty clear as to what it was. So why don't you go with me to Luke chapter 21. I want us to read verses 20 through 24. So that's Luke chapter 21. And look at verse 20 through 24. It says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, okay, that's the Romans, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people, referring to the Jews in the first century. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations in Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So what I want you to notice there in Luke chapter 21 verse 20 is that the abomination of desolation is associated in some way with an invading army surrounding Jerusalem. And this was the Roman army. Now, there's some important facts that we need to know about the history of that time period. It's important to know that when the Romans came to lay siege to the city of Jerusalem and surrounded its walls, that they were carrying ensigns. Okay, they were carrying flags with images of the reigning emperor on them. The reigning Caesar and divine honor would be rendered to these images. In fact, once Rome had finally breached the walls of the city, they performed, animal sac uh, they performed sacrifices at the temple in worship of Titus. And Josephus talks about this in the Wars of the Jews. And Josephus was a Jewish historian who got to bear witness to everything that took place. This is what he says. He says, And now the Romans, upon the burning of the holy house itself, and of all the buildings round about it, brought their ensigns to the temple and set them over against its eastern gate, and there did they offer sacrifices to them. Now, this would have been an extraordinarily abominable act to any Jew in the first century. This was abomination, and this was idolatry, pure idolatry. But even the presence of the Romans outside of the city was marking the beginning of the end. But I think that the destruction of the holy city and the holy temple by the Romans was the most abominable act that brought about complete desolation. I mean, there was nothing left. It's the event that made Israel and her temple utterly waste. And you know, Jesus predicted that this would happen on other occasions other than here in the Olivet Discourse. For example, in Luke chapter 19, verse 43 and 44, he said, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, remember, when Jesus predicted that not one stone was going to be left upon another, you have to understand how significant of, of a prophecy this was. 
Because, remember, Herod the Great, he, he was one of the greatest architects. I mean, he was seeking to expand Solomon's temple, to have this temple be the most beautiful, glorious, well-fortified temple and city that there ever was. Uh, some of these stones weighed over 100 pounds each, being 40, uh, about 50 feet in length and about 20 feet wide. These were massive stones, and Jesus said that not one of them was going to be left upon another. You know, the sack of Jerusalem that was led by Titus in 70 AD was far more extensive than the sack of Jerusalem that was led by Antiochus. The holy city was about to become a heap of ashes because the wrath of God was about to fall upon it. These were the days of vengeance. And because of that, that's why we have the warning to flee. There's the abomination of desolation, but that leads into the warning to flee in verses 16 through 20. Look at verse 16. It says, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now this command to flee is reminiscent of the command that was given to Lot. Remember when he was in Sodom and the angels came to him warning of the judgment of God that was coming upon Sodom? In Genesis 19, verse 17, it says, And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. Well, so it was for the Christians who were living in Judea and the city of Jerusalem during that time. They needed to get out of there. They needed to flee to the mountains. Otherwise, they were going to be swept away. And I would just have you note here that this also was applicable to people living in Judea. Okay, this wasn't only for the citizens in the city of Jerusalem. It was for the whole countryside. Anyone who was even living in Judea had to flee to the mountains because you didn't want to be anywhere near Jerusalem when the Roman armies began to approach them. Not even Judea was saved. And, and you have to know that the Romans were absolutely ruthless. They were merciless. I mean, from Galilee downstream to the Jordan River, they were just plundering all the villages that came into their path. There was widespread bloodshed in the land of Judea. And so Jesus told his disciples to make sure that you flee to the mountains, which again is very significant. He doesn't tell the people in Judea to go to Jerusalem. Now, during invasions, Jerusalem would have been the most natural place to run to, but Jesus warns against taking that measure in this case. But during that time, I mean, that's, that's what the Christians would have naturally thought they should have done when they saw an invading army. You need to get into a well-fortified city that has well-fortified, stabilized walls defending you. you now, sometimes a whole army could be held off by just a few soldiers if they were in a well-protected city with strong walls. And that's what Jerusalem had. And, but Jesus is saying here that Jerusalem is no longer going to be a safe haven. The city of peace... The city that, that God is going to defend is no longer safe. So don't go there. Because wars are decreed. Desolations are decreed. And there were no towns or villages that were safe when the Roman forces sought to take control. So the temple, Jerusalem and all the surrounding villages need to be left completely vacant. You need to get out of there. You need to flee. And as a matter of history, we know from the reports of Josephus that many Christians actually did flee. They fled to the mountains of Pella. And so I would just point out that if Jesus isn't referring to the events that culminated in the sack of Jerusalem in 70 AD here, well, then the Christians evidently misunderstood Jesus' prophecy. Because when they saw these things happening, they knew not to go to Jerusalem, but to get to the mountains and flee. Because Jerusalem is coming, going to be crumbled down to the ground. Now, you may be wondering, well, how could Christians feasibly escape when Rome's armies were right there? 
Well, I think that when the Christians were in the city of Jerusalem and they saw a sight of the Romans approaching them from afar, that that gave them enough time to get away. But there's also a cool, interesting fact to know about that time period. You see, in AD 66, the Roman troops who sought to lay siege to the city were unsuccessful in breaching the walls of Jerusalem, and surprisingly, they left. They took off. Because in 68 AD, Vespasian had received news that Nero had died. And so he he took his troops and he withdrew and he began to go back to Rome. But on his way to Rome, he decided to send his son Titus along with the troops back to Jerusalem to, to, t- to, to take control of the city and level it to the ground. But during that time period when Rome first came, left, and then came back, there was a little slot there. A little window in which God was giving the Christians an opportunity to flee for their lives. Now, when that was going on, you know that the zealots weren't doing that. They didn't flee. They were actually just preparing for battle because they thought this was finally going to be the opportunity where they were going to see the salvation of God and God was going to overthrow the Romans. And so they prepared for battle. But the Christians knew that it was a lost cause. They weren't going to be victorious. Jesus had predicted that this was going to happen and they needed to flee. If you look at verse 17, Jesus said, Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Now, in ancient Palestine, rooftops were flat, it was a place for them to pray. It was a place for them to fellowship. It was a place to to find some quietness. But even when they were on the rooftops and Rome was approaching the city of Jerusalem, they had to flee. They didn't even have time to go down and get their cloak. They just had to flee. And the idea there, some theologians think that the idea is that they're just going to hop from one rooftop to the next rooftop to the next rooftop, get to the end of the city, get down, and flee for your life. Because wrath is coming upon this city. You have no time to waste. Verse 18, he says, And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And then in verse 19, it says, And alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Now that word alas is a word that means woe. Woe to you. Now this isn't the same word that Jesus used when he was declaring Judgment and condemnation upon the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23 where he said, woe to you. That was a woe of condemnation, but this is a woe of sympathy. Jesus is saying for those who are, in, who are, who are, who are pregnant and nursing infants in those days, woe to you. It, it's a note of sympathy because when someone is pregnant and when someone is nursing an infant, it's going to make it all the more difficult to get out of there. And then in verse 20, he says, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. You don't want this to be during the winter time. Because the winter time in Palestine is the rainy season. Cold winter rains would so often bury many of the roads in mud, making it difficult to travel. It would flood the Jordan River, making it difficult to cross. And Josephus even reports that in the spring of A.D. 68, that Judean fugitives were trapped at the flooded Jordan River and were slaughtered by their pursuers because of it. Winter made traveling extremely difficult, dangerous, and just undesirable. So pray that it's not in winter, and also pray that it's not on a Sabbath. Now you can understand why you wouldn't want it to be on a Sabbath. It's because few people are going to help you on that day. The Jews take this day very seriously. Uh, Many would even try to prevent traveling, uh, people from traveling more than a Sabbath day journey, which was just one mile. And they needed to get a lot further than one mile. And on top of that, people weren't going to show hospitality to you on the Sabbath if you were out traveling, breaking the Sabbath traditional laws. But I just want you to notice in all these verses here how oriented this is to first century Israel. Israel. 
Okay, this isn't warning Christian in the plains of Manitoba in the 21st century to flee to the mountains when the Great Tribulation comes. The terminology here is all constrained to first century Judaism, and the command is very clear. It is, get out. Wrath is coming upon the city. The temple is going to be crumbled down. Make sure to get out and flee for your life. You know, isn't it interesting that Jesus has no problem with his disciples giving up their lives for the sake of the gospel? In fact, he calls us to do that. Tribulation for the sake of the gospel is a noble thing. But when it comes to the destruction of the temple, this is not a cause worth giving your life up for. So he tells the Christians, don't just stay in the city. Get out of there. Flee for your lives. That would be the more wise action to take. So there's the command to flee. And then there is the great tribulation. Look at verse 21. It says, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. Now, I understand that there are people that want to argue that 70 AD doesn't work in this framework because of this verse, particularly because it says that this great tribulation is such that it hasn't occurred from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. But literally speaking, that doesn't work because we know that there have been other future tribulations that were worse than the tribulation in 70 AD, such as, you know, more all the Jews that died in the Nazi uh, death camps during the Holocaust, where there were six million Jews that were executed. And, And you could point to all kinds of other tribulations as well, that you could argue was more worse. But I would also say that what took place from 67 to 70 AD uh, was the, led to the most deaths in terms of the percentage of people that died in a short span of time within one city. But the idea that this must be future because of this, I think is just an example of reading the scriptures through the lens of 21st century literalism. I think that this fails to understand the use of hyperbole in scripture. And when you interpret scripture by the scriptures, I think that there's no problem with seeing this as referring to a 70 AD fulfillment. Because scripture uses this kind of highly stylized language when speaking about something that is significant, whether it's referring to a person that is significant or an event that is significant. And this, is all, this kind of language is used all over the place in the Old Testament. For example, think of Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 9, when God was speaking about the fact that he was going to use the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem in 586 B.C., This is what it says. It says, and because of all your abominations, I will do with you what I have never yet done and the like of which I will never do again. Well, did God do again what he did in 586 BC? My friends, he did it even worse in 70 AD. Think of Hezekiah, great king, isn't he? In 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 5, it says, He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. So, when speaking about King Hezekiah, there's no, no one better than him before, and there's no one better than him afterwards. So we would think, until we get to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 5, When speaking of Josiah, it says this, Before him there was no king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. So the same thing that was said about Hezekiah is said about Josiah just a few chapters later. You see, the point of that kind of language is that the authors of Scripture We're emphasizing the significance of this individual. Hezekiah was a great king. 
Josiah, well, he too was a great king. And they use the same kind of terminology. But if you read it in a kind of literalistic <coughs> lens, well, you're going to find a contradiction, but it's actually not contradictory at all. It's just the way that we use language. And I think that you have the same idea being expressed here Matthew 24, verse 21. This great tribulation was significantly great. The greatest that Israel during her covenantal history had ever seen. Now the word tribulation means oppression. It means affliction. It means trouble or disaster. A great disaster, a great time of trouble was coming for them which was the great catastrophic event that descended upon the Jews through the Roman armies. 67 to 70 AD, there were were four years of hell on earth. Remember, the Romans were merciless. They allowed no one to surrender. Okay, so once you were in the city and those walls were sealed off, there's no getting out. That's it. And not only that... But civil war had broke out within the city. Even before uh, the Romans had, had breached the walls, Jerusalem was in turmoil. There was internal conflict among various Jewish groups, especially because of the zealots. And they were just fighting each other and killing each other. Famine was so severe that they were beating each other to death just to get someone else's food. Some of the stories that you read about and the wars of the Jews are just horrendous. It's, it's, you don't even want to speak of them. Josephus reports that there was one woman who roasted her baby, ate half of him, and then when she was being approached by the Romans, she started to hide the other half of her baby and concealed it, and the Romans knew that she was up to something, and so they asked her what she was concealing And then she took the other half of her baby out and offered it to the Romans, saying, have mercy on me. It was complete madness in the city. By and large, it was burned to the ground. And on July 17th, AD 70, sacrifices had ceased. The sacrificial system was done away with right then and there. Until this day, it has not been re-erected. So by the end of the Jewish-Roman War, 1.1 million Jews were massacred and many of them had died on crosses. The Romans were just crucifying these Jewish people on crosses to the point that they ran out of crosses and they ran out of space to put them. I was listening to one preacher preach on this passage this past week and he said, isn't it interesting how the city that crucified Christ was crucified by the Romans. 1.1 million Jews massacred for rejecting their only hope of salvation, Jesus Christ. But there was also 100,000 lives that were spared and taken captive. And this leads us to the promise of mercy. Look at verse 22. It says, And if those days... Had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now there's some people even in my camp who want to isolate verse 22 from verse 21. They'll say the great tribulation is in the past, verse 21 is in the future. But I just don't think that that's necessary to do in this case because the those days in verse 22, and if those days had not been cut short, are the same days referred to in verse 19, When it says, and alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. So we still have 70 AD in mind. But the reason why people will universalize this is because it says that no human being would be saved if those days had not been cut short. To which I would simply say, you cannot universalize a verse that is locally constrained. Okay, so it's not referring to no human being in the world would be saved. It's referring to no human being in Judea and Jerusalem would be saved if those days had not been cut short. 
You see, the point is that if God would have allowed those days of great tribulation to run their full course, then every inhabitant of Judea and Jerusalem would have been slaughtered. No human being would have been saved. But in the fall of Jerusalem, God preserved a remnant of people, not because those people were deserving of mercy. They were preserved by virtue of the fact that they were in the presence of some Christians, which indicates to me that for whatever reason, there were some Christians that were unable to get out of the city in time. What we read here calls a, alludes to Isaiah chapter, or I think could be an allusion to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9 which says, if the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. And the same is true in 70 AD. If God had not left a small remnant, then Israel would have been, become completely like Sodom and Gomorrah. There would have been no survivors left. You know, I think that this shows us that God stays his hand from destroying communities and nations whenever there is the presence of Christians in those places. You know, it is a mercy of God for there to be Christians in this community. It is a mercy of God for there to be Christians in Canada and in the U.S., but if you were to completely get rid of all Christians and the light would just be completely extinguished and darkness would hover over everything, it would just become ripe for total destruction and desolation. Well, let me close with a few, well, just a couple of concluding thoughts here. Sometimes people ask the question, you know, does this text have anything to do with a future great tribulation. And to that I would say, in a direct sense, no. But in, in an indirect sense, yes. You see, I believe that what happened in 70 AD establishes a pattern that will be repeated in another way again. Now, I don't believe that a future great tribulation is going to have a one-to-one -one correspondence with you know, what happened in 70 AD so that everything that, took, that occurred in the past is going to be replicated in the same way again. Um, that's not how I view this. I think, I think about it like this. I think that what took place in 70 AD serves as a prototype. It serves as a microcosmic foreshadowing of something that will take place on a macrocosmic scale. Just think about it this way. Think about the first exodus when Israel was delivered from Egypt. That first exodus in scripture prophetically prefigures a greater exodus to come which came in Jesus Christ. But the greater is always greater than the first fulfillment or the first pattern that was established. And that's what you see in scripture. Very often an event establishes a pattern that in some way foreshadows something else to come. And that's how I view uh, 70 AD. I think that Jesus is directly referring to the events that culminated in the sack of Jerusalem here. It was going to take place within their generation. But the siege of Jerusalem and their temple foreshadows the siege of the Antichrist, in my mind, upon the heavenly Jerusalem and upon the spiritual temple of God, which is the church of Jesus Christ. So that what took place on a local level in Jerusalem is going to take place on a global scale all around the world because Christians are all around the world. I think that's what Paul is dealing with in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he talks about the great rebellion, the revealing of the man of lawlessness, him taking his seat in the temple of God. I think we're talking about a future great tribulation where the Antichrist and his forces is going to lay siege to the church of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have time to develop my case for that, so you'll have to take my word on it. But secondly, and most importantly, this is what I want to say. 
The words of Jesus Christ never fail to come to pass. So flee from the wrath to come. You know, what took place in 70 AD once again vindicated, vindicated Jesus as a true prophet. Once again proved that he is the Messiah because not one stone of the temple was left standing. It was torn to the ground. But you know, in 33 AD, when Jesus had said this, this would have been unthinkable. Yeah, yeah, right. Herod's temple is going to come crashing down. Sure, Jesus, sure. Because everything was peaceful. Everything was relatively peaceful. And if anything, the Romans were going to be overthrown, not the Jews. You know, some people say the same thing today. They say, where is the promise of his coming? They say, life is good, life is peaceful, and there's nothing to worry about. But brothers and sisters, God will deliver on his promise. And there is a day of wrath coming that will make the judgment upon Israel seem like a mild act of discipline. It will be so terrifying that people will be crying out for the rocks of the mountains to fall on them rather than to face the wrath of the Lamb. So just as Jesus warned his disciples to flee the city of Jerusalem, may I admonish you to flee from your sin and flee to Christ. He is the only safe haven. He is the city of refuge. The only safe place to be is in the kingdom of God. And to find entrance in the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You must repent of your sins, and you must put your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you are not clothed in his righteousness, then wrath will fall upon you. This was a severe warning. And time and time again, we have the warning in Scripture to flee from the wrath to come. There's a day of judgment coming, and I want you to know that there is good news for all those who come to Christ in saving faith. They will find shelter for their souls, and they will be welcomed into the eternal kingdom where we will be with him forever and ever. Let's just close in prayer. Father in heaven, pray that for anyone who doesn't know you today, that today would be the day of salvation. They would know that wrath is coming upon this world. May they not avoid it, neglect it, put it aside, but that they would deal with the reality of their spiritual dilemma and in seeing the dilemma that they have, that they would cast themselves upon the mercy of God. Father, I pray for each one of these precious people here today that you would draw them closer to your Son, that you would grant them understanding, that you would give us wisdom in these days to know how we are to respond to the various things that we see going on in our world. God, in a time of crisis, we know that the safest place for us to be is to be right here in your word. So write it upon our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.